I hope what I say now will build uh, very clearly on, on the excellent opening presentation we had from, from David. Um, in particular, I'd like to set out DFID's thinking um, on resilience. We produced an approach paper um, a couple of months ago setting out um, what we think resilience is all about, um, and our Secretary of State has emphasised that this is something that DFID will be taking forward very seriously. And then I'd like to say a little bit about how um, this is relevant to Pakistan, where I spent uh, 10 months um, in the last year. In 2010, natural disasters affected more than 200 million people, killed nearly 270,000 people, and caused over $100 billion in damages. The frequency and scale of disasters is likely to continue to increase over coming decades, partly due to population growth and migration of people to more exposed situations, but global warming is going to make droughts hotter and drier. The international community recognises that more needs to be done in anticipation of similar events in the decades to come. And building disaster resilience is, will be an important part of that approach. Does this work? Here we go. DFID's 2006 disaster risk reduction uh, policy committed us to mainstreaming DRR into country strategies and made the links with climate change and it committed us to spending 10% of humanitarian spend on post-disaster building back better, the Hyogo commitment. Um, and in some ways, we tend to think of this as being um, part of the disaster agenda, and I'm going to be setting out why this really needs to become more of the development agenda. In 2010, DFID commissioned a team led by Lord Ashdown to undertake an independent review of our humanitarian and emergency relief activities, and a key recommendation in that report was that DFID should give greater anticipation to anticipation of rapid onset disasters, including building resilience in those places where people are most at risk of such events. Um, and DFID's working definition um, of resilience is the ability of countries, communities and households to manage change by maintaining or transforming living standards in the face of shocks or stresses such as earthquakes, drought or violent conflict without compromising their long-term prospects. Um, the UK government has accepted the main recommendations in Lord Ashdown's her report and has committed us to addressing resilience in all DFID country programmes by 2015. Six high priority countries have been identified, Ethiopia, Malawi, Mozambique, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, a second tier of countries um, and two regions, the Sahel and the Caribbean. Um, and as DFID tends to do on these occasions, we have produced a framework within which we will think about the issues in these countries. Um, and as David said uh, in his presentation, uh, the context is very important, and it's a context that really needs to be recognised from the perspective of the people involved. What is it that we're talking about resilience to? And it can be at the household, community, institution, or national level. Secondly, we need to be clear about the nature of the disturbance that we're talking about. And, and uh, I think we, we need to distinguish between shocks, sudden events which threaten a, a failure in functionality, droughts, floods, hailstorms, cyclones, but it could be a biological event such as a pandemic or a locust outbreak. Stresses are slow burning drivers of vulnerability that will amplify and trigger uh, these shocks. Land degradation, deforestation, water scarcity, demographic changes. This is where resilience as a concept starts to um, turn into sort of practical understanding which is different from simply saying it's the inverse of vulnerability. The, the capacity to deal with the disturbance um, uh, can be divided into the exposure to the risk, which is the kind of thing that you would assess in a hazard mapping exercise, practical implication. Sensitivity is the degree to which um, something or someone will be affected by the shock. Um, and uh, picking up on David's point about women being uh, more resilient, 80% of the people who died in the tsunami, the Asian tsunami, were women. Um, and in the 2002 floods in Pakistan, 
80% of the people who died were women, uh, which suggests actually they, they may be really tough and bear the brunt, but very often their ability to cope with the shocks and stresses that they face um, is actually um, not uh, on the same level as the, as the men who, who, who experience them. Thirdly um, is the adaptive capacity. When faced by the shock, uh, what is the ability of, of people, individuals or communities, to recover? <coughs> Sorry, my microphone's gone walkabouts. Um, this is a, a little cartoon rather than a graph. I think cartoon is, is a word to... to uh, to use more often on these things. Um, but it shows clearly um, the impact of a shock at time t naught. Um, collapse in functionality when a shock, shock happens um, down to a low point, then a slow recovery back to normal. Um, the exposure, reducing the exposure of the shock will reduce the likelihood that actually a, a, a uh, a collapse in functionality happens. Reducing the sensitivity of the household um, will reduce the size of the fall. Improving the adaptive capacity will um, increase the, the speed with which recovery happens. And the area under the, in the triangle is effectively um, the, the degree of uh, loss of functionality. And, and as resilience improves, the, the size of that triangle will decrease. This maps very neatly onto DFID's familiar livelihoods framework, for those of you whose memory stretch, stretches back a decade, um, and, and I think points to really one of the key practical issues for building resilience is that it's about building the assets of households or communities uh, or institutions, um, which uh, improves the ability to, to cope, and, and this comes with the concept of coping strategy. Um, I won't, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with that. I'd like to move on to talking about um, the context of resilience in Pakistan um, and, and the floods that happened there last year. Heavy rainfall and flash floods combined to create an area of flooding equal to the size of England, uh, which moved across the country over some weeks. In parts of the north, 10 years of rain fell in one week. Six months later, uh, there were still substantial areas of flooding in Sindh province. Some 14 million people were displaced by the floods. 1.6 million homes were destroyed or damaged. 2.4 million hectares of crops. One quarter of the national uh, summer harvest was lost. The international funding for emergency and relief operations was something like $2 billion and the costs of recovery and reconstruction a further $10 billion. Um, the immediate priority in a situation like this is obviously rescue and relief, provision of food, water, shelter, access to health services, uh, and that accounts for about half of the response from the international community. And the balance was, was allocated to supporting recovery. Um, DFID's efforts in this area were mainly on livelihoods recovery. We also worked on education. Um, and in, uh, in, in the, the Hyogo approach, this was clearly uh, an effort of, of building back better. Now, if you were applying um, the, sort of the, the thinking about resilience in the context of an event like the um, Pakistan floods, um, the, the ways in which you would reduce exposure would be in, in improving flood forecasting and management, improving watershed management, improving flood defences. Um, reducing sensitivity, um, it is often the most poor and most destitute people who find themselves in the most hazardous situations. And where such people can't be relocated to safer places, it's really important uh, that their basic needs are addressed through social programmes. And for me, one of the top priorities in, in building resilience, particularly in anticipation of the fl floods which happened the following year, was building nutritional security, particularly for women and children. Um, but there's a, a range of, of, of ways in which you can build community assets to um, improve resilience. And enhancing adaptive capacity is, is about um, strengthening all of the actors, not only at the household level, but at the community and national level, to disaster response. 
And I'd just like to emphasize that cash transfers proved um, a highly innovative um, and very important part of the humanitarian response um, to the Pakistan floods. Um, in approaching a wrap-up, what I'd just like to reflect is um, the, the question that, that David also raised, which is, you know, is this anything new, building resilience? Is this not just um, improving coping strategies, reducing vulnerability? And I know that the Global Donor Platform, um, as was uh, uh, said in the opening address, um, has proudly waved the banner of, of Paris and Accra. Um, in recent years, and uh, now we have Busan, um, and, and it's, for me it was really important that paragraph 27 in the Busan outcome document um, specifically said, it was, was titled, Partnering to Strengthen Resilience and Reduce Vulnerability in the Face of Adversity, and, and this I think is a real hook for the global donor platform. Um, a lot that was done in Pakistan was quite easily reckonable as building resilience. But I think that the point here is that um, this is not just about um, doing it during an emergency. And I think this is a key element of DFID's approach to building resilience, is you don't do it after the event. This is something that we need to address in all country programs where there is a significant risk um, of these kinds of disasters happening. And it is actually true in most, um, if not all, uh, of the country programs where DFID operates. Uh, building resilience will be an, a, a more important um, element of DFID's country programs, particularly in the, the face um, of increasing uh, risks from climate change. Um, I think that is all I want to say at this point. I'll answer other points. But um, just finish with this lovely picture of um, uh, response in, in uh, Pakistan. The, this, this is a group of, of women who, who are now proudly um, uh, keeping ducks rather than chickens, and they're very proudly showing us their, their duck eggs. They've made one big mistake, which is that they shouldn't put all their eggs in one basket. Thank you.